Hello! Man, it's really cold in the lab today. <laughs> um, this week, I'm not moving very far from where we were last week. Right, so in the last video, we were talking about how a blow to the side of the head here is, is surprisingly dangerous for a number of factors. If you didn't see that video, go back and uh, hear all about the middle meningeal artery and epidural hemorrhages or extradural hemorrhages. This week, we're only going a little further away. We're just going down here. I want to talk about how a simple ear infection can lead to death. And it does lead to death. It used to be worse, better now with antibiotics and stuff. But how on earth can in an infection in the ear kill you? Ear, ear. Um, okay, so ear infections are more common in children than they are in adults for a couple of reasons. Um, one of those reasons is that the, the child's skull isn't quite the same shape as the adult skull, right? So here's the external ear, here's the middle ear, the inner ear is inside the bone here, and this is the, the uh, eustachian tube or auditory tube, um, or pharyngotympanic tube. And there's an opening here, which is inside the nasal cavity, and there's an opening here, and there's a membrane in the middle. So um, these openings in these spaces allow uh, air pressure to equalize on either side of the tympanic membrane and hearing happens, right? That's how hearing works. But in children, these spaces, you know, they're being spaces within the body, they can be prone to getting infected. You can get a bacterial colony growing in there quite happily. And because this eustachian tube, sorry, this pharyngotympanic tube or auditory tube as we should call it these days, is shorter and more horizontal in children, and uh, they're more likely to get an infection in that space than in adults, our, us, us big old people. Um, those, the sloping tube is more likely to drain stuff back into the nasal cavity rather than stuff from the nasal cavity, likely to go laterally, just a short way to cause an infection. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so middle ear infections, this space is prone to infection. Most ear infections are not a big deal. Uh, they get treated, they clear up, they go away. But some ear infections hang around. And some ear infections become problematic and they can spread. Now, what structures have we got around here that an ear infection could spread to? You remember those paranasal air sinuses that we looked at? We find some spaces in the bone kind of around the nasal region. And those spaces are filled with air and they're lined with a mucous membrane, and they're not completely closed spaces, they open, so that again, the pressure can equalize within those spaces, and sometimes they get infected, and that causes problems with pressure and causes pain and what have you, right? Well, this is like the paranasal air sinuses, where it's just the same, but instead of being around the nasal region, they're in here, and this is the mastoid process. Now, which bone is the mastoid process within? Well, look, here, Here's your ear hole, there's your external acoustic meatus there, right? Dunk, dunk. So your ear is here. Um, and you can find the mastoid process on yourself, because you've got your ear. If you, find, if you go a little bit posteriorly, there's a nice lumpy bit of bone there you can palpate. That's your mastoid process. And we looked at the sternocleidomastoid, uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the past, didn't we? And the sternocleidomastoid muscle passes between the mastoid process and the sternocleido, the sternum and the cleidoclavicle, right? The two heads down there. So the sternocleidomastoid muscle is going up to the mastoid process there. So what bone is the mastoid process part of? Well, it's easier isn't it, if we have a look at this skull here. So we've got all the colours now. It's part of the temporal bone. So the temporal bone and the mastoid process of the temporal bone. This is the, the squamous part here, the flat part. Here's the parietal bone, here's the frontal bone, there's the sphenoid bone, there's the occipital bone. So the bone we're interested in today, the bone we're talking about, is the temporal bone. Uh, and we're looking at the mastoid process there. Look, you can see the external acoustic meatus. Okay, so let's pop this skull uh, open. 
and look inside. Now, this bit here, right? So there's the, uh, there's the mastoid process. So this is the temporal bone here. Just on the other side there, that lumpy ridge of bone, that's the petrous part of the temporal bone. And inside there, that's where this stuff is, right? That's where we find the middle ear and the inner ear. Look, there's the mastoid process there. Ooh. Okay, so the structures of the ear are really close to the mastoid process. The mastoid process has air cells within it, just like we talked about the ethmoidal air cells, just like these paranasal sinuses, there are air cells within the mastoid process. And these air cells, so this isn't as, as solid a piece of bone as you might think. It's actually, a, um, it's kind of a, a very, uh, it's a very lightweight, very hollow bone. But those air cells or those air spaces are just like the paranasal sinuses. So they're, they're not enclosed chambers of air, they're open so that the pressure can equalize inside them relative to outside. And they, of course, they open into, they open into the middle ear. That's how the air equalizes. That means that an infection in the middle ear, if it hangs around, if it persists and spreads, and those bacteria get really comfortable, they can spread into the mastoid air cells. That's not gonna be good, is it? We can see those air cells on this bone. So we looked at this model when we were looking at the middle meningeal artery, which is popping up there. Here's a cutaway of the skull here. Here's the mastoid process. The mandible's been cut away and much of the ear has been cut away. But we can see here how aerated those air cells are. And this is just posterior to the ear. So what, we, what might we see in someone who has a persistent ear infection that's now starting to spread into the mastoid process and those mastoid air cells. Well, they're all, they will already have had ear pain and maybe, maybe some discharge from the ear and probably some headache as well. Um, but if it's spreading into the mastoid process, then we may find the pain with some tender pain posterior to the ear. We might see some redness and some swelling. Um, the ear pain may get worse. They might get headaches. Um, the ear might even get pushed away, it might change shape a little bit as the space posterior to the ear starts to swell. So we might see changes to the external ear itself. Um, and we have a couple of other anatomical issues as well. We can see a nerve here, right? And there are two cranial nerves close by. Now this cranial nerve, this is the facial nerve. Cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, and the facial nerve is cool because it does loads of great things in the face, in the head generally. But also, it takes some really funky routes through the spaces, the bony spaces that the parts of the ear, the inner and middle ear reside in, right? Which means that as this infection gets worse, it could impinge upon the facial nerve. Now the facial nerve, um, one of its big jobs is motor innovation to the muscles of your face, right? Muscles of facial expression, the ones I'm using now to move my face. So if the facial nerve gets damaged by an infection in the mastoid process, in, in the mastoid uh, process, you might see some effects, some weakness of muscles of facial expression. You can, you can test, that's, that's part of your cranial nerve test repertoire, right? Like, you know, anyway. So it might affect the, the facial nerve. Now if we go back to the skull, here, I'm going to need a pipe cleaner. Pipe cleaners, right. That foramen there, that is how the facial nerve gets from the brain stem into the, the bony spaces, the peaches part of the temporal bone, which it there then wanders through to get out into the face. And there's another nerve that goes in there as well, which you can probably guess because we're talking about the ear. It's the vestibulocochlear nerves. The vestibulocochlear nerve also goes through this internal acoustic meatus to get to the inner ear. And the vestibulocochlear nerve, as is the job of, uh, oh, there's the, there's the vestibulocochlear nerve there. Um, but the job of the vestibulocochlear nerve is to carry sensory innovation information from these funky structures of the ear. So we're talking about the semicircular canals 
and their role in, in vestibular function, you know, balance and what have you. And then we've got the cochlea as well and its role in hearing. So an infection might directly impinge upon these sensory apparatuses, apparati, um, within the, the petrous part of the temporal bone. So you might have a loss of hearing on that side, or there may be some effect on vestibular function, either through directly affecting these structures or by affecting the cranial nerve carrying that information back to the brain. So you might have dizziness, you might see vertigo, uh, uh, the, uh, what's it called when you get uh, infection of the labyrinthitis, isn't it? If you get an infection of yeah, the semicircular canal, so labyrinthitis. Um, so you might see a number of things. Um, oh, you can see those air cells and air spaces in there as well. Look at that. We've also around here got the mastoid antrum, which is another space oh, within the bone. So already this uh, infection is spreading and is getting worse. Um, um, there are other symptoms and it's getting more dangerous for the patient, but it can get even worse. And before, um, the, on, before the, the start of the use of antibiotics, this was like a, a significant cause of mortality in children. So how does this get worse? Well, look, so this is the mastoid process. Those are the mastoid air cells. Here are the cranial nerves here and the inner ear and the middle ear and what have you. And look what's on the other side of that bone. You're inside the cranial cavity. So an infection can occur within the bone here and it can spread through the bone and get into the cranial cavity. So now, just like the middle meningeal artery, you're in that space between the bone and the dura mater. Oh dear. Now, so the bacteria have gained access inside the, the cranial cavity in this middle or posterior cranial fossa. So this is bad, isn't it? What might we expect to happen next? Um, we'd be worried about meningitis, an infection of the meninges themselves. We'd be worried about um, an extradural abscess, or a collection of pus and bacteria between the dura mater and the bone, compressing on the brain, bone and causing all sorts of horrible things. Um, we could even worry about an infection passing through the connective tissue layers and getting a, um, a brain abscess, which would be even worse. All of these things are incredibly dangerous. Meningitis, you know, is likely to lead to death. So, treatment with antibiotics will treat this. Um, the problem is, of course, that because of these air cells inside the mastoid process, it's not an easy place to get to. So even if you think you've cleared the infection using antibiotics, there may still be some remnant infection within the mastoid air cells. So watch out for repeated bouts of infection. Watch out, watch out for these signs we've talked about recurring. And it may be that um, to really clear out the infection here, because it's so dangerous, it may need a hospital stay, with intravenous antibiotics, it may even need surgery into the mastoid process to drain these mastoid air cells and really, really clear this infection. But if somebody has had prolonged ear infection with pain, with headaches, and those headaches are getting worse, well, really, it would be very nice to have a CT scan or an MRI scan to see what's going on in there, right? because uh, there's a risk of bacteria passing from the spaces within the ear to within the cranial cavity through the mastoid air cells. That's it in a nutshell. And that's why this anatomy is important. So there we go, that's a pretty serious topic, um, but with some, I think, very interesting anatomy. Isn't it, all the things in the, would you, anyway, cool anatomy, this isn't something, this sort of infection passing to the cranial cavity isn't something that occurs, you know, really commonly, but of course, if it does occur, it can be catastrophic. So when you see those signs and symptoms, this is the anatomy you should be thinking about. Okay, right. Well, I enjoyed myself talking about this anyway. Um, see you next week.